Good afternoon. Hello. The only thing about public speaking that I hate is the introduction. Um, so thank you for doing that. That was so sweet. I appreciate it. Do I? Is my mic on? I don't think it is on. I'm good. Okay, good. Y'all can hear me, right? I'm not. I just need to make sure the audio is getting picked up because we're going to apparently use this later on. And so, thank you for coming. We're so glad you're here. We need to make this last an hour and a half for the CLE people. Um, so we'll do our best to do that, which means I'm going to go really slow. You will not recognize me because I'm so used, y'all are used to me being fast. So I'm going to try to go slow. Here's the most important thing you need to know today, and that is if you're in the room with me and you're filling out your CLE paperwork, there's your number, the one for the live show. And if you are watching this sometime later, then you're going to have to use the bottom number for video. And I know with that done, you can all tune out and we don't have to listen to the rest of this, right? Eileen, yes, ma'am. Oh, good. Thank you, Ella. So now we know my first slide was totally worthless and you didn't need to pay attention to it at all. Thank you for clarifying that so nobody has to turn it in themselves. This can be so much fun, Robert. Okay, somebody tell me, you all know the subject that we're talking about, the Public Information Act, and everybody here, and there are a few of you who I've never seen before in my life. That would be you, and you, and you, and maybe you. So, does everybody here have just the fundamentals of Public Information Act? Yes? Okay, good. So, one of you who knows more than the fundamentals, tell us the main purpose of the act. Transparency, that's exactly right. Tell me the presumption under the Texas Public Information Act. Uh-oh, everything, uh -oh. everything is presumed public, that's right. So those were the softball questions. Let's get a little bit harder. Somebody tell me if you can, somebody give me an idea of when this quote may have been written. Vince, can you see it? Of all the open records laws in all 50 states, when it comes to public access, the state of Texas has perhaps the most open of all. Got to be a Rick Perry quote. Rick Perry is what you're saying? Any other takers? Any other? Any other? Um, because I'm actually asking for when it may have been said or written. John Hill. John Hill. Those are all good guesses. It's actually a 1991 Texas Law Review article. 1991, and actually the title of the article is something to do with open courts and <laughs> making the judiciary part of the act. So this is the context in which Senate Bill 1368 was passed. And the purpose of the CLE is not to argue whether it's right or wrong, whether we want transparency in the law or not. It's to give you a trip down memory lane, how we got where we are, and when, you, and when we go through it, you're going to see it makes perfect sense. And then to give you some best practices for ways to make sure that Harris County never has to go looking through your personal email <laughs> accounts or your personal cell phone. Can, can that be an agreement that, that that's what we're he why we're here? I'm not going to tell you anything about exceptions to disclosure. I'm not going to tell you how to make a cost estimate. I'm not going to tell you um, how many days you have to write to the AG. Right? Okay, so let's just start. Back in 1995, there was an open records decision that had to do with calendars. Okay, and it was railroad commissioners. Can you see Vince? Okay, good. Um, it had to do with two railroad commissioners, and there were actually three calendars in this case. The Public Information Act request was for all scheduling appointments for two particular railroad commissioners. One railroad commissioner had two calendars. One she had, the opinion says, obtained, I think, or acquired prior to her ever being on the railroad commission. The second one she bought with her own money after she was a railroad commissioner. The facts with regard to that commissioner were that those calendars did include personal appointments as well as railroad commission appointments. And her, one of her staff members had access to those calendars and made some of the entries. The other commissioner, it doesn't really say how she had acquired her calendar, but she kept it herself. 
She wrote her own notes in it, and it did include some Railroad Commission business entries in it, but she kept it herself. There was no evidence that the state money had been spent to use it or to um, maintain it, and she kept it with her. It wasn't out on her desk or Katrina's desk or some Nancy's desk. And the AG said, guess what? The calendars that were used by the state employee to keep those entries, those calendars were public information. It did, in their entirety is what the opinion says, in their entirety. Now, the, that commissioner could argue that some of the stuff, some of the entries had exceptions to disclosure, but the, the calendars themselves were, in fact, collected, assembled, and maintained by the governmental body. With regard to the other person's calendar, the other railroad commissioner's calendar, they said, you know what? That's really her personal stuff. And the fact that it has some railroad commission business on it is just sort of a side effect to make sure that her personal life doesn't conflict with her job. Okay? The only argument made to the AG was it was not, the calendars were not collected, assembled, or maintained by the governmental entity and the government, no, that was it. That was the only one made, the only argument made. So 1995, fast forward to 2001, and we have, a, we have a city council member who gets a Public Information Act request for all the emails on her home computer only related to city business, okay? And again, the city argued, that's her home computer. That's not collected, assembled, or maintained by the city. The city has no right of access to it. And the attor those were the only arguments made, and the attorney general said, you're wrong. It's public information if it's related to city business. Okay. 2001. Does that look like a 2001 computer? <laughs> I, I, try, I tried to, I, it's hard to keep up with that. Okay, so now we go to 2009, and this case involves emails and text messages. Again, a city council person, it's a guy in Lubbock, and he is texting during a city council meeting, apparently, and so what happens? The media says, send me the, send me the text messages, and they also ask for his emails. With regard to his emails, the city council member told the AG, all my emails I do on the county computer. And taking him at his word, is what the attorney general said, taking you at your word, then the, your home computer emails are not going to be subject to Public Information Act. But your text messages are because, even though it was his privately owned cell phone, he was getting an allowance from the city for it. So with those two different devices, the home computer, it's not collected, maintained, or assembled by the city, and the city had no right of access. But with regard to the text messages, they probably do have a right of access. I'm not saying that these conclusions by the AG are right or wrong. I'm just, again, trip down memory lane. You following me? So this goes on, and in 2010, we get the big one that turns into litigation. Oh, by the way, 2005, got that, got that. The 2005 one about... 2001, yeah, this resulted in litigation as well, but the case settled, so we don't know exactly what happened. So it was not very helpful for us in determining what a court would have done with it. So fast forward to 2010, past the text messages, and we get to private emails maintained by a county commissioner related to county business are subject to the Public Information Act regardless of where they're kept. And I want to walk through what the arguments were made and tell you the facts, okay? This is Tommy Atkinson. Tommy is still Precinct 4 Commissioner in San Antonio. He um, serves on a multi-jurisdictional agency about transportation policy in the San Antonio metro area. And he had come out publicly saying, I don't like toll roads. We should not have toll roads. Enter a woman named Terry Hall. Terry Hall is a self-professed mother of, homeschool mother of eight turned citizen activist. And if you 
downloaded the materials that I put, or that Diana put on the website for you. I gave you links to Terry Hall's blog. She, this woman is very active, and one of her um, organizations is TERF, Texans United for Reform and Fiscal Responsibility. I don't know, but she is an activist. She's a strong activist. And we can probably surmise that she had an email with the commissioner that might have said something different from what he had said publicly because the Public Information Act request comes from the San Antonio Express News to the Bear County DA. Okay, remember that's a district attorney's office that has a civil section in it, not like our office and the district attorney here. They start, this is when we get the first constitutional argument. And I'm so glad Mike Cole and Bruce Powers are here. Y'all just chime in anytime you want. Um, the argument, th they made the same collective assembled or maintained argument. It got blown out of the water. No, no, no. The, the constitutional argument was under the Fourth Amendment search and seizure. And the commissioner said, even though I have these private email accounts and I use, I do county business on them, to, to respond to your request, somebody's going to have to look at all my personal emails. And that's, that's an unlawful search and seizure. And this is how the AG got around that. The AG said, Dear Commissioner, <laughs> under the Public Information Act, you are the Public Information Officer for Precinct 4. Therefore, the only person who has to look at them is you. <laughs> and so how can there be a constitutional violation? That's what the AG said. So what happens when you don't like what the AG says? File a lawsuit. File the lawsuit, baby. You file a lawsuit, you file it in Austin, and in cross motions for summary judgment, the district court sided with the attorney general who made all the same arguments that you would expect him to make. The case is pending on appeal before the Third Circuit, and I gave you links to the attorney general's brief, which is all about transparency, to the uh, brief filed by um, Denton Lowell and Navarro, whatever that law firm is. They filed a brief on behalf of the commissioner and an amicus brief. And I, if you've got the time, they're pretty interesting. The amicus brief is filed by the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press. It's 22 pages, and it starts talking about, um, it's got to have, we got to have a right of access to this to, quote, allows reporters to serve their fundamental constitutional role as government watchdogs and surrogates of the larger public. And I know we have a First Amendment in this country, but I don't remember media being defined in the Constitution. Is the media defined in the Constitution? I don't know. Then it goes on for 22 pages giving tangible examples of the potential real-world harms that arise when public officials attempt to evade the disclosure requirements of public records um, by communicating on private platforms. And they start off with that guy from Detroit, the former Detroit mayor, who testified under oath in a civil rights case that he and his chief clerk were not having an affair, and then the text messages bear out that not only were they having the affair, but the taxpayers were paying for them to go have their rendezvous. And it goes 20 more pages of similar bad acts by elected and appointed officials all across the country. So the case was pending, and I think the briefs were filed like in August of last year. Actually, it's this year. April 30th is the amicus brief. Um, but instead, doesn't matter because we got Senate Bill 1368. And Senate Bill 1368 went into effect September 1st, and it just codifies everything the Attorney General's been saying. And that is that it, even though the collected, assembled, and maintained language is still in the statute, it goes on further to say, well, electronic communication is public information if it's related to public business, regardless of the device it's on, on any device. 
doesn't matter who owns it, doesn't matter if it's your private Gmail account, your Hotmail account, your phone, doesn't matter who pays for it, it's on any device. And they give some examples of the kinds of information that they're talking about. And of course, we're all familiar with email, internet posts, text messages, instant messages, but if they were smart enough to include other electronic communication because there's gonna be more stuff that we haven't thought of yet and they want this to be included. So, what happens if all this is public information? Can you see Wally going to the records retention office and he says to the guy, these valuable documents should be stored for five years. And the little guy behind the desk takes them to the trash can, deposits them and says, this job got so much easier when I realized that nobody ever asked for anything back. So, if these things like text messages and email on your private email account are public information, then the Texas records retention laws apply. And that puts a big burden on us. And I thank Marva Gay for this beautiful slide and the next one. Y this sound familiar? Local Schedule GR, Paul Scott. Does that name sound familiar to anybody? Right? Okay. And what do, they, what do they tell us in the records retention stuff? Content controls. It's the same thing. This is a content-based analysis by the Attorney General and by that district court. If it's about public business, it's public information. Doesn't matter where it is. So, same rule, content dictates. Um, you're going to see this. We've got new personnel regs on the agenda next Tuesday. And you're going to see something that says, we don't want to go look through your personal email account. But to the extent you do county business on it, and if we get a Public Information Act request that would require us to do that, we're going to ask you to give it to us so we can go look at it. So what's the best practice then? No email? Can you be more specific? Because we can't function without email. I mean, okay. really. Through your, through your private email right. So to make it more specific, no email on any platform other than the county server. Even if you're doing it from your own personal cell phone that we don't get an allowance for, if you're using your county email uh, account, then it's going to be on the county server. And when one of us comes to you and says, hey, I need to see your, all your emails, and did you do any on your, on your personal cell phone, if you can tell us, actually, I did do some on my cell phone, but, or it's better yet, no, never. I never did it on anything but the county email system. Even when it was on my cell phone, it was through the county email system. Then we'll never have to look at your phone because we will just look at the county system. The second best practice is if you don't have that access, and I had somebody in the auditor's office tell me, when I am out auditing a small JP court, I cannot get to my county email, so I just use my Google account and Google to my boss. Well, the second best practice then is to just copy your county email, and then we'll rely on ITC to keep track of it. And not only with records retention, um, but with regard to producing it if we ever do get a request <coughs> that would involve yours. Um, mini, mini lesson on employment law, because I can't resist. So you're sending your email to the boss at yahoo.com from valuedstaffmember at gmail.com, and you're copying yourself at your HCTX. Dot net address. I really need to fire Jane Doe. She takes too much FMLA, and now she wants to work from home. Can I fire her? See, that, that, that's just not going to work. <laughs> Can't do that. Don't do that. So the mini lesson is not just what device you're using, what platform you're on. It is what you're writing. Be careful what you write. And every single person in this room knows that already. Okay? Every single person in that, this room knows that. Any question? Yes? If I am at home and I'm not coming to work. Right. Right, right. Thank you for the softball. Public? 
Public, yes. Okay. It's about county business. Yes. You're not going to be there, but look at this. Remember under the records retention schedule, yes. transitory information loses its administrative value when it's received or read, so you can delete. You can delete right away. And I think, I'd leave it to our PIA folks, what, Rose Mercedes, what do you guys think? If we had that issue and she was able to say, you know, any email that I sent from my personal account only had transitory value and therefore I delete them immediately, would we want to go search the rest of her computer? The, <laughs> the AG took that city councilman at his word back in 2005. I don't know whether they submitted an affidavit or whether it was just a representation by the attorney who was representing the city council member writing to the AG. But in terms of, that happens a lot in employment cases. What my ITC folks say is that if you hit send and it doesn't rebound, you can guarantee that it got there. Agree with me, Chelsea? Yep. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, I brought, I brought a plant. <laughs> I'll, I'll introduce you to her in a minute. Okay, so. Unless it goes into the ether. The, the ether? Mm -hmm. Yes, because sometimes they don't bounce back and they're not ever received. server, but it may not have gotten to the county or the district server. The inbox, right. So each of the messages when they're sent, they have the, some other information that's contained with them that's called metadata that yeah. actually contains all the details about where that information went. So that's where, to your point, it may have not gotten all the way to the sender's inbox, but they'd be able to confirm that it got to that other um, organization's server, mail server, maybe it's hung up there. So we'd right. have enough information to say, yes, it left our system and, and where it was received. Um, so there, there's quite a bit of forensic data there to help support this. But the, but the big issue is to answer Alice's question of, would we have to go read her personal email account if she tells us that any time I sent a, a county-related email using that personal account, it was only transitory information, and my custom and practice was to delete that day. Do we think it, it may be a question that we don't ever want to have to answer? Well, let me rephrase that. It's absolutely a question we don't ever want to have to answer, <laughs> but it is a, it is a good question. Because if there's pending litigation, you can't delete it. That's true. If she still has it, if she still has it. Um, no, no, no. The IP server always has it. And the computer may still always have it. Yeah. And she moved houses and she sold her computer and does not have access to it. Yeah, depending on the retention of the server. .com will have it. Probably. Oh, they probably That's with it. regard to litigation. But remember, we're trying to respond to PIA requests and give best practices for PIA requests, which it's really hard not to morph into that employment law stuff. Because and I'll, I'll tell you this, in employment law, the first discovery request is I want every email between the plaintiff employee who was fired or demoted or not hired and her supervisor. And I want every email between that supervisor and the HR director of that department for the last two years. And in that situation, we are going to come get it and we are going to look at every single one of them and we will probably produce every single one of them as well, okay? Because that, in a litigation environment, it's not limited to the county business. They but will they look. Every personal email to business. That's a very good practice. So, so let me just go back to this first one, Merce. <laughs> Always use a county server or a county device for the county business. You're so smart. Okay, so transitory information. I am finding right now at this point that the vast majority of text messages that county employees are using that have to do with county business are what I would consider transitory information. Call me. I'm going to be late. Let's meet at 2 o'clock tomorrow afternoon, right? We have to be careful in the future because our communications are changing. I'll admit, three years ago, I used to 
get so mad at employees who thought they could text their boss and say, I'm going to be late. And three years later, it's like, yeah, everybody does it. I do it. <laughs> so we, we have to make sure that we do not send serious non-transitory information like hey are you gonna vote for that or you know don't fire that guy although that might have another a privilege an exception to disclosure under the public information act but we really need to be guarded that we keep these electronic messages that are not on a county server to transitory information to transitory information and that makes sense doesn't it now I want to tell you a couple more security issues because these came up as I was preparing this presentation and it's stuff I didn't know. Um, first of all, if you are, say you have your iPad and you're using your county Gmail, excuse me, you're using your county email accessing through the server and somebody has sent you a spreadsheet and you know you're about to go to the doctor's office and the doctor's office might not have Wi-Fi for you to connect to your county server so you download that spreadsheet to your iPad you now have a county document on your iPad right so keep that in mind similar situation you're at home working on your working on your county server doing what you're supposed to do according to the Mercedes rule doing your county business from home you print to your home printer huh I didn't know you could do that but ITC tells me you can do that and guess what you put that document on your printer and there's a record there so our office I mean, think about a hospital district. You guys have patient records. We may have social security numbers. We recently had a, Brian, was it chief clerk? Somebody in a JP court who was doing payroll from home. She had her, lap, her county laptop stolen from her home. And at first she said, oh my gosh, I had payroll data on there. Well, salaries, who cares? That's public. Date of birth, your EIN, um, if it had social security numbers, heaven forbid. Um, home address or anything like that that's a security issue that's a security issue um, questions or comments about that right practically speaking mr. Ryan is saying yeah we're all fools if we think nobody can go find us <laughs> They can go find us. Is that your point? Well, not just that one, because you hear all the time about social security numbers. Right. But the number of things that require it that are uncontrolled, not confidential anymore, it's just not a secure number anymore. Well, we, it's just another time for us to sit back and remind ourselves. Public Information Act exists. It exists for a valid purpose. You can't get out of it, which I think is that. You can't get out of it. If you think you're going to protect something from disclosure or from being public information because you're doing it from a different fishbowl, you're wrong. It's not going to work. Now, I got to tell you, I've been doing this presentation for I don't know how long now, um, shortly before September. Since I did it for a particular commissioner, the commissioner sent an aide to ask me this question. Snapchat. Are y'all familiar with Snapchat? See, the young people are shaking their heads. Okay. Yeah, Snapchat is an application for an iPhone, and I will see if I happen to have any Snapchat. Huh? No, it's not anonymous. No, I don't have any in my inbox. Well, mine aren't anonymous. If you're getting anonymous Snapchats, then <laughs> I so. It's a, little, it's a little app, and it has pictures. It can do video. You can add language to it. You can add text. Gee, aren't I cute? You put your finger on it. It appears for five seconds or something like that, and then it disappears. And so this particular commissioner was saying, ooh, Snapchat. That might work. And I sent word back through the aid that, first of all, let me tell you that you can freeze frame a Snapchat and take a picture of it. So don't think that you're going to try to, what's the word for that? It's control that thing. The screenshot. The screenshot, thank you. Screenshot. You can screenshot it if you're fast enough. It's only up five seconds, and you're usually looking at it and going, oh, that's so cute. Oh, shit. Um, you know, but you can 
you can do that. And I sent word back that said, please tell your commissioner that he needs to not be making comments like that because it sounds to me like he's looking for ways to get around the Public Information Act. And that can't be good, can it? He did not send you an email asking. <laughs> <laughs> I have had emails from him from a private email account, which we now know would be public information. However, it might be an exception to disclosure based on an attorney-client privilege conversation. But yeah, I have had some from his private Gmail. So, and it was legitimate county business. That's a good. Read your email. Uh, Windows reads your email. Everybody reads your email. That's a good. That's a good argument. Yeah. That's a good argument. So that's the bottom line. Um, gosh, Diana, do I need to stall some more? Oh, I know questions. Well, let me let me because I, mean, I uh, uh, this is really a fact. Robert is on is everybody needs because it makes you think. But uh, this is no comment on anybody in particular, but because of the situation uh, that helped get certain people elected in 2009, and Ellen knows this, uh, in actually elected in 2008, take office in the first 2009, so you get paid on the first day of the year. I had to convince all my colleagues that we had to be going in on the first day because they like to get paid. That doesn't happen anymore because of the Affordable Care Act. Just want you to know that. So. The Affordable <laughs> Care Act takes care of a public official not being sworn in it, it, so they can receive pay and benefits? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were talking about that. They have to work on the first to be eligible oh. for their benefits by ah, March, by okay. April well, that's 1st. So that's a better reason. Anyway, so, and I had, Rose might remember this looking around the room, I had an Apple II Plus in the early 1980s when I was the, uh, I, I might not have been the first assistant, and people at work used to hate it because I could type at work at home and I'd bring the disk to work. And then I'd have my assistant print out these messages to the people in the office. So uh, it beat my writing because anybody see my handwriting, you can't read it. Is uh, uh, before then I had the uh, the, uh, duplicate, uh, yeah, the triplicate the triplicate uh, yeah. memos. So we could keep one copy, give one to Rose for the questions, and one could be kept as a store copy. So I'm only saying that because I'm a big believer in technology, but. Because of some of those issues, I came in office realizing that I could say all day long that that wasn't me on my county computer. And I might be able to really prove it at some point in time, but the front page, or nowadays the Snapchat, is Vince Ryan looked at what, Vince Ryan said what, and life is too short. So Nancy, where Nancy is in the building right now, is the only person, well, we made some else though. I do not know the password for my county computer. Uh, Nancy looks at it and gives me what I need to see. And I don't think, right now, I don't think I owe anybody an email. I do have a personal computer that I bought with campaign funds in the little middle office. I don't get that anymore because it's an old ALL account on it. And my cell phone, has anybody in this room other than Robert ever called me my cell phone? Does anybody in the room know my cell phone number? Don't call me my cell phone because the message says don't leave a message. And while my number probably pops up, my point being, I've gotten the opposite extreme from all this. But what's good about it is one is, and I'll just use an account example, is for the multiplicity of media and the multiplicity of ways of communicating now is mind numbing. Every day there's something new. This Snapchat, I just read an article about it, is. And we, as the attorneys for everybody else in the county government, have to be probably more conscious of it than anybody else because we're constantly being asked to communicate. Is I'm not, by the way, advocating anybody in the office. I don't know what I'd do if Robert didn't answer his cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> or, but well, like Terry, it's a good example. Another issue is Terry's got two cell phones. He originally got them, Terry O'Rourke. One is he pays for himself, and that's his personal business. The other is county business. But guess what? As soon as you call somebody, they got your cell phone number, your email address, and they'll come communicate with you. So the reality is, to the extent 
that we got to remember this and then counsel our client representatives is that there's no secrecy anymore. Uh, and if you think there is, or even privacy, if you think there is, there isn't. And then in the public sector, virtually everything she's really saying is, when in doubt, it's public. And part of the problem becomes assuring ourselves that our public officials we deal with understand that, right? And your presentation is just a, it, it happens faster than we keep up with, so. Let me tell you, uh, the electronic media that you do have, Mr. Ryan. <laughs> Well, yeah. well there, there's another one you have that's not personal, but that we need to think about in our office, and that's the Facebook page. Because your Facebook page is now subject to records retention. And so just yesterday, let me introduce Chelsea Russell. Chelsea, stand up for a second. Chelsea works for ITC, and she's been on this Road and Pony show with me. She is our new security director. And just yesterday, we, she got an email from a department, that, and it was OEM, right? Uh -huh. And saying, okay, OEM puts out a lot of information on their Facebook page. Has, has ITC thought about how we're going to retain the records of what was put out there? And I went to Suing and Defending Governmental Entities this summer and saw a speaker on Senate Bill, well, actually PIA, discuss Senate Bill 1368. And he said the best he's got right now is to tell those people, those elected officials or governmental entities using a Facebook page, print the screen every day and keep it. That's the best advice he had. Now, and, and, and say that it wasn't, but you also have a records retention obligation. So if it's transitory information, commissioners, uh, no, you don't want to use commissioner's court will meet because that might, you might be relying on that for your posting for the Texas Open Meetings Act. But if, you know, county attorney's Facebook page, come see Eileen, talk about PIA. That has no value. You don't have to retain that posting. What else is out there and how long do you have to keep it? If you don't know, you better be telling your clients to print it every day, or sh can you screenshot it? You, you probably can. You could we just began our research, and, and so far there's not necessarily technical, technical solutions that plug and play and make that easy. Right. So it's going to be something that we have to kind of cobble together and, and create on our own, and it's not going to be very streamlined. It'll probably end up being pretty costly and, and have a big administrative overhead. And how much control will ITC have over it uh, when it's... it's <laughs> right. <laughs> Right, so that's a good place to go for help is to ITC, but they can't do everything for us. So security issues and records retention obligations. And yeah, then... I bet you Facebook has everything. Has everything? Yes. Facebook well, they may have it. Maybe you could get it since you may are getting it from Facebook. Maybe it could be quick. Good luck getting it now that we have to have search warrants to, uh, to get a grand jury subpoena to get no, 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 no. Verizon to give us somebody's yeah, cell phone records. In some case, all you do is get a subpoena for, from uh, his provider. You don't need a grand jury subpoena. All you need is a subpoena. A subpoena subpoena, not a grand jury subpoena because it's a civil case. Right. Okay. Brian, did you have a question or a comment? Yeah. You, well, let me make sure I understand your question. You, is your premise that an empl we got a request for an employee's stuff and, the, and we told the employee to go look for it? Because that's not the way it's going to happen. <laughs> we're going to, and unless it's an elected official, we might. But I, I, what we're envisioning and what I'm hearing throughout the state is, here's my cell phone, and if you think I have text messages on here that are county business, you get to look for it. I left an elected official cell phone with ITC for one hour at the last change of administration. And in that hour, I, they were able to get all of his, not just the ones he could see on here, every text message back for about, I only asked for a period of 10 months, and they got every single one of them. And I had to read every single one of them. So. It's there, even if it's even if it's not on your phone. And I do know how to change my SIM card now. Right. 
the, the AG, okay, first, let me clearly say that I told everybody we weren't going to talk about this stuff, but let me punt an answer to you since you're the boss, and those of you, Mercedes, pay attention, Rose, pay attention. Okay, the cost estimate, you, I don't think you get to factor in electricity. There's an overhead cost. There's an overhead cost that the AG builds in to that. That is, uh, is it a per page overhead fee or something? Oh, she's retired. She uh, did? Hadassah has retired, but there's now wow. a new Hadassah. Yeah. Um, and that poor person will be called the new Hadassah for 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the problem is you have to do the most economical and least expensive. So if you can do it electronically, you have to do it electronically. Uh, you can do an hourly rate, but it can't be an exorbitant rate. But I thought your specific question was about the electricity and well, stuff well, like I that. Mean, that's what I mean. How do we do the cost? You have to guesstimate how many hours it would take. Let us say five seconds to review each text or, or each email to determine if it's germane. You've done that. How do they say that cost still the hourly kind of? On an hourly basis, you determine how many seconds or how many minutes, how many hours times X, and if it's 100,000 documents, that's what it is. That's the cost estimate. Are you guys, do you guys have questions or? Okay. Sumter, you're good back there? Okay. Okay. What about, what about somebody we don't know is here? Question. Well, they looked like they were trying to get somebody's attention, so I just wanted to make sure I was giving them an opportunity to ask questions. And I'm going to wake Glenn up any minute now. Um, Ella, what's? You and me, sister. <laughs> um, my Facebook page. Mm -hmm. Facebook, every once in a while I want to know whether or not I posted something or, or not. And I go back and I go, Ella, and it just tells me everything I've done. You posted this, somebody commented about this. I mean, it tells me way more than I ever wanted. And how far back does it go? That would be the question. Rose said earlier Facebook has it all. If we were to get a something that somebody said we weren't following the records retention policies and it does it go back like some of the some of the records with some of the records retention from whenever you have the account i think it can go all, all the way, way? Oh, yeah because they want to know how to get you and what you've done throughout if your taste has changed or whatever because they can sell that information right right okay so unless you've deleted or purged your history right oh, well, see, I'm not you, you you can teach me that later. You can teach me that later. A period of time that you could still retrieve it, like we talked about, where right. data is deleted. It, it may still be it within Facebook servers, uh, but it'll eventually get written over if you if you've removed that data. I don't think they're keeping things once you. Oh, I don't know. Be, uh, She's suspicious. Is, uh, yeah, She's naturally okay. suspicious. It could, it could be. Well, I'd say anonymous. Then the storage is storage is very expensive, so I don't know that, that they could yeah. keep it forever. On, beha never know. on behalf of Bruce High, bandwidth is not free. <laughs> there you go. So that could be though. To your point, we don't know. I guess that's the bottom line. We don't right. know what Facebook's practices are. Yeah. So. AT and T just did an article saying AT and T's been selling phone numbers for years. You just I hate them, don't numbers, you? I don't like having the thing here because I don't know how to hit to end. Anyway, that's it. That's the end of my presentation. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. It, to the extent that I can, a lot of them are unanswerable. It's just one more reminder that we live in a glass fishbowl and we have to be careful and we have to make sure our clients have this information. Oh, Canada. But again, he had the perfect excuse, though. This is a public He was drunk and didn't remember. He was so drunk he didn't remember. <laughs> so it is, sometimes there is no excuse to say things better than what it's up there. So anyway. Okay, well, thank you. Do we get to tell the state bar that's an hour and a half? No. 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 Okay. Da 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 da. It's all her ethics issue, right? Yeah. It's already done. She's got a picture too.
I told you I was going to talk slow.